Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Uh, good to be with you today. Um, I hope you've been, been meeting with Jesus this morning. Um, uh, it's been a good morning so far. I just want to encourage you that God does speak. He's a living God. He's alive. He rose from the dead and he's speaking to us still today. Um, and you believe God was speaking through Adam and, you know, just want to re-emphasize that really, to come and get prayer if you felt like God was speaking to you. Yeah. Uh, we also believe that God heals as well. So if you um, have some ailment or injury or sickness, whatever it might be, we, the team would love to pray for you at the end. Uh, we're seeing... Uh, a, a slow, steady uptick, increase in people being healed. Um, people are giving their lives to Christ. We believe God is on the move in this place. We believe God is about a great work with Hope Church Seven Oaks, and um, you get to be a part of that, not just by sitting here on a Sunday, but actually joining in, joining teams, serving, um, and it's through the faithfulness of God that, like Anne shared, that we have this building and the people playing their part. And you can play your part in the next part of the history of this church because God is about a great work. And we believe more and more people will get drawn in. And I'm going to talk a bit about that today. Um, God just drawing people in. So I just want to encourage you, if you're starting to come, if you've been here for a few weeks or months, hey, get involved. Come and speak to me. Uh, come and speak to Adam or one of the other elders. Um, and we would love to be able to help you be a part of this family. Um, Anyway, moving on, we are in our Greater Story series. We are in week four this week. Uh, we looked at the creation of the world, how perfect it was. We looked how God created humanity and said it was very good. And then it went, pretty, it went sideways pretty quickly, didn't it? Um, last week, Jeeves looked at Cain and Abel, and we saw humanity just spiralling further and further, and we saw the first murder, mother. Um, how sin was crouching at the door of Cain, and how Cain let it in and destroy him and control him. Jesus talks about the journey before sin, in terms of temptation, in terms of our own attitudes, angers, that sort of thing. How to deal with temptation in our life. Uh, how we should guard and watch what we watch, what we let in ourselves, what we consume, be it through TV or films, etc. Even what we let our kids watch. I mean, you even have to be careful what's happening with Disney films these days. It's not a brave new world anymore. It's a strange new world. So we have to be alert on what we let in. And what we're seeing through the early pages of Scripture is humanity ignoring God and constantly moving further and further away. And today we're looking at the continuation of this story. Noah and the Flood. And I'm sure we all know this story and maybe we'll get sucked into the kind of misconceptions around the story. We love to tell our kids this story and paint murals on their wall in the nursery. Oh, look at that. Isn't that nice? There's the animals. There's the lion. Oh, can you see the per pelican? Can you see? That's what we tend to still tell our kids. We like to sing the song, the animals went in two by two. Hurrah, yeah. hurrah. You all know that one, right? Yeah. Yes, good. <laughs> But we tend not to retell our children the story that God flooded the whole earth because humanity was so bad. That he had to start again. That all of mankind, apart from Noah and his family, were drowned. We don't, we don't put that bit on the picture, do we? Oh, look, there's the animals, there's the giraffe. Oh, look, there are the drowning people. No, we don't put that on, do we? But let's, so let's look at this story and see what God is saying through it. And we're going to start from Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, 
it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. Its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above. And set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you, and every living thing of all flesh. You shall bring two of every sort in the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this, and he did all that God commanded him. But we start here with this incredible story of God flooding the whole earth and wiping out humanity. And often when we start to really think about the details, we might skim across the surface of the details and think, gosh, this is terrible. This is awful. But what we're seeing here in this story is the severity of sin, the seriousness of sin, and how it has an effect on God. Human behaviour grieved the heart of God. I've heard people talk about uh, Adam and Eve when they were banished from the garden and they weren't allowed to eat. Remember they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They weren't allowed to eat from the tree of life. But we need to stop and seek to understand what we realise is God is showing mercy and grace all the time. And by not allowing Adam and Eve to have eternal life eating from the tree, he's preventing them from living in their sin forever. Thereby giving a means of escape. And God, we will see in this story, is always showing grace. And throughout this series of the greater story, he's always showing grace. He always has justice. And he will judge the whole earth. Time and time again, there appears to be hope for humanity through a man, only for them to disappoint. We saw the failure last week of Cain, and then Adam and Eve had another child called Seth. Maybe Seth is the one. He will bring about this new humanity, only for Seth to make mistakes and turn from God and his line. And we get to this part in the story where history, in history, where mankind is so terrible, God is grieved that he made man. And we look at these incredible verses, verse 5 to 6, it says, The Lord, oh, we're going too far there. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Humanity had gotten so bad, God was grieved. This word regretted as well doesn't mean that God made a mistake. More he is grieved, he is sorrowful that his children have gotten so bad. God is, of course, perfect and doesn't make mistakes, but he is however full of mercy and grace. Knowing that his creations will move away from him, he is constantly giving second chances. And we're seeing through the early pages of scripture that God is the only answer. (laughs) The problem of the whole earth is humanity. The human heart is the cause of the world's problems. And we tend to think of history 
Human history, like a bicycle, that one generation gets on the bicycle, pedal, pedal, pedals, makes progress, moves forward, they die, fall off. Next generation gets on, pedals, pedals forward. We're looking at all this progress we're making, they die. Next generation gets on, oh, I can't believe they thought that, can't believe they did that. They were terrible, the last generation. Let's make more progress. But the reality is that humanity's history as sinners is a stationary bike. It is not always progressing and not always getting better. We think, oh, but we've made all of these medical, technological improvements. Oh, we're much less violent. No, but the life is still full of violence and evil. We only have to switch on the news to see that. Why is that? Because of the human heart. I, I said something recently that made me think, why do, I, why do I say that? Why do people say that? So, because in reality, it's a horrible idea to say. So, something nice might have happened, or someone's helped you, or done something nice for you, you might say, it's restored my faith in humanity. Yeah. That is a terrible idea, by the way, to have faith in humanity. <laughs> to think that people are intrinsically good, that... People are good-hearted, except now, you're all very nice people, I'm sure. You're all much nicer than I am. But the Bible tells us that left to our own devices, we are terrible. And only God alone is good, and only through him can we conquer and fight against sin. And we can read this story and we think, where, where are we in this? Who am I in this story? If you think you're Noah, you're wrong. We are not Noah, we are sleeping with the fishes. That's who we are in this story. And Noah, we must understand, is not saved by his own righteousness. He is saved only by God's grace. And when it says Noah was a righteous man, it was only really in comparison to the people around him, not to God. And it is only through this all-powerful God who sees the very intention of our heart that we can be set free. This wooden boat, Noah, would have been given careful instructions, more than we read probably today, on how to build. It's an early picture, this wooden boat of the wooden cross that will save many. For another, judgment is coming. And that one day every person will stand before a holy and righteous judge. Where will you be? Where will you be in this new ark, in the new vessel of salvation, Jesus Christ? The human heart still has the intention for evil and violence. We see terrible things happening all over the world. Events in Jerusalem in the last week or so, the Ukraine war, and we think, hey, we've, but we've improved, we're better humanity, aren't we? Well, that's not what history's telling us. But there's less slavery, isn't there? No, there's more slavery now than ever before. Is that true? No, you can't be right. Hey, just look into child sex slavery or human trafficking. Even a general consensus of people doesn't mean that we will do things the right way. History, again, will tell us that. We only have to look at Nazi Germany, the transatlantic slave trade. Even today, abortion has become totally acceptable across the board. And this is not to condemn, but merely to point to people, to God's design and the right of every living being, no matter what age or stage. God is also about redeeming people from whatever they've done. And abortion is not the unforgivable sin. Anyone who's been affected by this is like everyone else. They need to repent and turn to God and he will forgive. God knows he needs to start again with a new humanity through, his one, through this one man, Noah. This type of Christ. It's called typology in the Old Testament, a type of Christ. Let's look at a few things here with the life of Noah. He stands out from the rest of the people around him. And although we are not Noah, 
We should seek to be like him, not fitting in with the world around us, not lost in our own desires for prosperity or fame or wealth. This Christ-like figure refused to cling to the cultural norms around him. And he stood firm for God. And when he did so, and the ark was finished, God's creation in animals drew towards him. God drew the animals to him. Noah wasn't running around chasing chickens. God drew the animals to him. And he is a reminder. Noah is a reminder that God's people are called to live out a passion for Jesus and his plan and his mission and his church. The great evangelist John Wesley was asked how he managed to fill the churches of England. He said, I set myself on fire for God and people came to watch me burn. Wow. And we too as Christians are ones that have a passion for Jesus and his kingdom and his church. And people will come. The building of the ark, as I said, probably came with instructions more than was actually recorded that this ship was rudderless, without sails, without oarsmen. Noah was, wasn't the captain of his ship with, in charge of his own destiny, but completely at the mercy of his creator. Yeah. Hebrews 11 verse 7 tells us that by faith, when Noah warned about these things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark. Common sense would tell you building an ark where he started to build it goes against the grain. It looks like foolishness. And this message of the cross that we preach is foolishness to those who are perishing. But like Noah, we are to label, labour for the gospel. We must be diligent in preaching the cross just as Noah was building an ancient picture of it. Noah had his commands from God. In chapter 7, verse 5, it tells us, Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. And we, like Noah, have been given a blueprint to be his witnesses. In what is known as the Great Commission, at the end of Matthew, Jesus says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptising them and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Will we, as the church today, stick to this blueprint for the new humanity? Or will we try to modify the message that we are given to suit modern ears? No, we stick to the word of God yes. and what it says. We don't change it to suit. We don't change it because culture might be coming against what the word of God says. Because as soon as we start to become like the world to suit the world, we, we are the world, and we've lost the message, the blueprint that he's given us. And do you know what? Statistically, churches that are moving further away from the word of God to suit modern ears are the churches that are in decline. And the churches that are holding on to the word of God and honouring God with his word are the churches that are increasing. Who knew? Who knew? If you stick to the word of God, honour him, bring glory to his name, he will bless Noah was obedient to God's word. And when the flood came in chapter 7, verse 18, it floated above the waters of judgment. And we are to build the church with faithful obedience to God's word. Any compromise or corner cutting, the ship would have sunk. And will the church float today above the rising waters? God promises if we build it his way, it will. And the people will come. Moving on. Chapter 7, the flood was about to start. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, I'm so glad we don't this long, by the way, aren't you? Um, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them, entered the ark. 
They and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark, and Noah with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark. It rose high above the earth, and the waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. It's worthy of note, actually, that the waters and the flood aren't mentioned not nearly as much as the ark itself, and it shows us that this ark has meaning, this vessel of salvation. And I would just encourage you to study the word as we're going through the book. We're still in the early days of Genesis, but I encourage you to be studying this in your own time. You'll see that this ark is, uh, uh, is seen as symbolic, like a symbolic temple. So the temple has three layers or zones, and the ark has three levels, all pa- pointing back to creation. So in creation we have Eden, we have the garden, and we have the middle of the garden where the tree of life was. And in the temple, they had the courts, the holy place, and the holy of holies, all pointing back to God's original design. And there's a great uh, video of a Bible study on the Ark from the Bible Project. We'll send that out this week, and it opens it up even more. I encourage you to watch it. It's educational, but it's also more amazing that there is so much in this. When you look at the Hebrew and the word meanings, There is so much more in the detail of this story than we have time for today. Actually, it does you good when you study God's word and you realise, oh gosh, all of this links up, all of this makes sense. Back to the story, chapter 7, verse 15. It says, They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded, and the Lord shut him in. As Noah continued in his obedience to the Lord, the Lord continued in his care for Noah, and he shut him in. Again, we have to see that this is pointing to a final judgment to come. When God closes the door, it will be final. And if your name is not written down on his, in his book of life, it will be too late. Now is the time to repent and come to Jesus. Be welcomed into this new ark of Jesus. When Noah came into the ark, he quitted his house and lands, and we must quit our own righteousness, our worldly possessions, whenever they come into competition with Christ. Noah goes into the boat, and for a while he must submit to the confinements and inconveniences of the ark in order for preservation for a new world. So those that come to Christ must be saved by him, must deny themselves and uh, suffer and serve for his sake. See, this gospel message isn't a gospel that says, come, everything will be great. No, it's a message that you must come and die to yourself. Pick up your cross and follow him. And any of us that come into the ark should bring as many as they can with them. Pleading, giving instruction, persuasion, good example. And those that by faith come into Christ, the ark by the the power of God shall be shut in. They will be kept in and never let go. This stronghold by the power of God. Matthew Henry says, um, God put Adam into paradise. But he did not shut him in, so he threw himself out. But when he put Noah into the ark, he shut him in. And so too, when we bring a soul to Christ, he ensures its salvation. 
It's not in our own keeping, but in the mediator's hand. The door of mercy will be shortly be shut against those that now make light of it. Now knock, and it shall be opened, but the time will come when it shall not. And so we see in Noah's time and the time to come, the waters rose so high it covered the mountain tops, and no one escaped. And no one will escape the judgment of God. God was wiping evil from the earth, and he will again when he returns. We have a just judge who is perfectly holy and merciful. So you cannot have a God of love without judgment. The Bible tells us the God of love is also a God of judgment who will put all the wrong things right in the end. Tim Keller says that belief in a God of pure love who accepts everyone and judges no one is a powerful act of faith. Not only is there no evidence for it in the natural order, but there is almost no historical, religious, textual support for it outside of Christianity. The more one looks at it, the less justified it appears. So it cannot make sense that God is only a God of love. And only in Christianity do people come up with this mistruth that God is just a God of love. But only through knowing a God who will be the judge who will bring justice to all can we put down our right for revenge and justice. Only through him can it bring an end to the perpetuating circle of violence and hatred. See, Jesus is the vessel. Jesus is the answer. Moving on to chapter 8 and 9. Noah and his family are on the ark for around a year, and the waters start to recede. And the ark comes to rest on the mountains of Ariat, which is in modern-day Turkey. Noah sends out a raven and a dove, and then a dove eventually returns with an olive leaf. And Noah knows he can get out of the boat. In Genesis chapter 8, 15 to 17, God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Noah emerges as this new Adam into a new creation. And this first day is like the new first day in the new creation, like it was for the first Adam. A day of rest and communing with God, and he builds an altar and he worships. And rest and thankfulness were his priority, uh, which is a message I'm sure we can all receive today. <coughs> rest and thankfulness was his priority. And we see through the end of chapter 8 and through chapter 9, God making a covenant, a promise to Noah and humanity. And he makes the covenant sealed in chapter 9, 11 to 17. He says, I will establish my covenant with you, but never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you and for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never rise, shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. And when the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This word covenant will of course be a theme throughout the Bible. It is used around 265 times in the Old Testament. There are different covenants through the, the Bible, and we will be looking at those in weeks to come, where God promises and fulfills, and man promises and fails. Time and time again, 
And this faithful promise is to all living creatures, a covenant not to flood the earth. His wrath would come down in a different way on the sin of man. And this rainbow, which is its true meaning, despite what some might think today, is a promise and a reminder. This colourful rainbow is more like a war bow hung in the sky. Mercy is pledged instead of judgment. Despite God knowing evil would still continue to spread, he promises to cleanse our world without destroying humanity in the process. This bow is not pointing down on humanity in wrath, it is pointing upwards where he will receive it into himself. The wrath of God would be poured on himself. God incarnate, Jesus Christ, took the wrath upon himself. Judgment is coming again when Jesus returns to judge the living and the dead, and he will make good on all of his promises. Those who have called on his name, who have confessed with their mouth and believed in their hearts will be saved. Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, when he tells us about his return, it will be like the days of Noah. People will be eating and drinking and getting married, and the second coming will happen. Judgment is coming. Jesus will return. So we are to be on watch. Be prepared. We mustn't let it be a distraction. You know, start, start storing up tin food and wearing tin hats. But we need to be prepared. We need to not let, let us be asleep. Let us not be unaware of the days that we're in. And we are closer every day. <clears throat> Every day we are closer, and we need to be aware of that. And this should spur us on to tell more and more people, come, come into the ark of Jesus Christ. Because a judgment is coming, and one day you'll stand before him. You may be going through some difficulty in your life right now. You may be struggling to see where God is, if he actually is real and cares. You know, the rainbow only appears when there's rain. It never appears on a clear, sunny day. If you're facing some difficulty now, the storm clouds are gathering, look up, there is a better day to come. God has promised he will redeem you. He has plans to prosper you and not to harm you. He has promised he will never leave you or forsake you. And one day he will wipe away every tear from every eye. And this rainbow is a reminder in the gathering clouds of his love for you. The greater Noah, Jesus, is coming. See, Noah was a righteous man, but there was still sin that entered into the ark. His sons and him were the great hope. And I will let you read on in your own time to see that they fall short of the glory of God. Noah comes out, oh, he's the great hope. End of chapter 9, chapter 10, not so much. They fall short of the glory of God. And just like you and me, imperfect, fallen, sinful, before a holy God, we stand condemned. But the greater Noah Jesus came, who was perfectly righteous. Noah and his family survived because of the ark's protection. And now believers are baptised in water in identification with Jesus. Baptism's on the 5th of November. If you want to be baptised, come and see me. We are baptised in identification with Jesus, who was plunged into the earth and ultimately raised from the dead. While this wooden ark delivered Noah from a physical death, the wooden cross delivers us from a spiritual death. Just as Noah obeyed God by climbing on the boat to save a few, Jesus obeyed his father by climbing to the cross to save many. Jesus Christ became the man Adam chose not to be and the man that Noah never could be. Adam was born without sin, but chose to sin. Noah was born into sin and could never escape it. But instead of temporarily obeying his father, only to succumb to failure, Jesus obeyed completely so he could be authorised to judge sin and crush Satan. 
and even in the washing of humanity away, God proved faithful because he spared one family that would lead to the birth of the Saviour. History was being pushed forward towards a better day, a day when earth will be restored, when creation will no longer groan in chaos, it will be restored and a new Adam will lead a redeemed humanity into it. Hallelujah. Romans 8, verse 1 to 2 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death. In the rising tides of today's sin and ungodliness, where will you put your trust in? Where will you put your trust in? Now, we're doing this all the time now because we want to give everyone every opportunity to respond to God. And it's only by God's grace is he holding off this second coming of the judging of the whole earth to allow as many to come in as possible. And today is an opportunity, if you've never responded to Jesus, if you've never given your life to him, Today is the opportunity to come to Jesus and repent. So we're going to stand. If you could stand with me, we're going to pray. You can now come to Jesus. Why don't we just bow our heads for a moment? This is an act between us and God, between you and God. If you want to say, Lord, I want to be found in you. I want to give my life to you. You might not have it all figured out. You might want to know what's on the other side of the door before you open it. But it's a very small step of faith. And God is wanting to encourage you just to make a very small step towards him today. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for the greater Noah Jesus Christ. Thank you that he died for us on the cross. There is nothing that we could do to earn or deserve his love and forgiveness. And if you make that step towards him today, he will forgive. You need to ask him for forgiveness. To ask him to come into your life. And he will. He promises to by the power of his Holy Spirit. We're just going to stand for a moment. I think God is speaking to us today. And if that is you, if you've never given your life to Christ, you want to call yourself a Christian, you can just, just even where you are in your place, just make a very small step towards him. We keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed for a moment. We we'll just show, by a show of hands. If you, for the first time, done that, given your life to Jesus, then if you could just raise your hands. That's why everyone's got their head bowed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are working, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross of our salvation. Thank you. Today will be the day of salvation. Thank you that we can put our trust in you and that you promise not just eternal life, but come and indwell in us and give us peace that surpasses understanding. Lord, help us be good stewards of your word, of your church. Thank you that you are the great Shepherd, Lord, this is your church. And we pray, Lord, in these coming days and weeks that many will come in, that you will draw many to yourself. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.